So we said the, the topic for today covers different aspects for computer vision. We have object detection, we have object tracking and geofence. So we will see all these topics together today. Um, yeah. So who we are? Uh, you see our nice faces here. Uh, Daniele will actually introduce himself later when he starts his part of the presentation. Um, so we'll start with myself. I'm Matteo. Uh, I'm a data scientist working at SAS in the uh, AI team at the uh, EMEA uh, re in the EMEA region. So you see here our LinkedIn uh, uh, website. So if you want to get connected, please uh, feel free to do so. So let's let's get started. Um, so this is the uh, the agenda for today. Uh, we will first uh, review a recent project uh, Daniele and myself myself have been working on recently, uh, just to introduce some concepts, and then we're gonna explain in details how. Uh, we met, basically we we managed to to build the system to solve the the business problem here. So we have two parts. I will cover the first part. Daniel will cover the second one, and then we have the Q and A session. And actually, I was reviewing now the the, the result from from the poll. It seems that almost no one uh, doesn't have any idea of the topic. So that's good. We at least uh, all uh, uh, like all of you at least know some. Uh, some part of the topic for computer vision. So that's good. We have some high level explanation, also some technical parts. So we, we hope we will make you all happy. Uh, okay, so let's get started. So let's start with the recent project we, we have been involved. So we got contact by, by a customer uh, and the, the, the let's say the, the business objective for the customer was to decide whether or not they should build a bridge in some specific location. So a very specific question. Um, talking with the customer, we discovered that the decision of building the bridge actually can be taken knowing the amount of traffic you have in proximity of uh, railway crossing. So when you have the crossing here, you, you have to know the amount of traffic. Of course, then the decision also is taken also consider other aspects like the budget and so on, but the knowing that the traffic was a crucial point for them. So they want to know which type of vehicles uh, are passing by. So whether they are cars or big trucks or only people. Um, so they can decide whether they need like a very, very robust bridge or they only need a lighter um, pedestrian bridge, okay? Only for a person. So, with this information, they could actually take the decision. We also got another request, which basically was that for the, the specific points where we decide not to build the bridge, can we create a system that generates alerts uh, when we have dangerous situation? For example, if we have a car stuck uh, in the middle of the railway when the train is passing by, right? So we need to create an alert if that is happening, right? So this was the, the business uh, uh, case the request that we got from the customer, and where, what we ended when what we ended up building is basically a system that is able to uh, identify uh, cars, uh, vehicles, and, and person basically. So we have the object detection model running here. Then we have our geofence, which basically uh, virtual fence, sorry, which are basically these two lines, and the system is able to count. Uh, whenever an object crosses the two lines, and we can we can let's say install, establish the number of vehicle or, and the amount of traffic, uh, let's say within a day, counting the the the, the vehicles passing by here, and we use uh, and we're going to explain how uh, this can work actually. But basically, we have when this uh, object crosses the two lines, then we add uh, we increase the counting here. Okay. So we, here we have the, the cars and the object coming from the right, and here we have coming from the left, so we can distinguish between that. But basically, this is the system that we have created. Moreover, uh, we were also able to say when an object is stuck uh, between the two lines, we were generating alerts, okay? 
So imagine you, you have uh, a video here running by and we have the system uh, scoring uh, frame by frame and uh, detecting the number of vehicles. So this is the system that we have built. Now, how can we build such a system? Uh, we basically have two phases, right? Uh, the first one is where we need to train the model the computer vision model, in this case, of detection. And of course, the system in which we uh, do that is different from the system that we use to score the model, to, to do inference, right? So in this case, uh, the environment needs to, for example, needs to have GPUs because we, like training the model is very computational intensive. And when, once we have this system, we load the data into 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 the environment. In this case, we were using CAS, which, which is basically the SAS engine. Of course, we are from SAS, we're using the SAS product, but of course you could do this with any other technologies. Uh, we process the data, so the, we do some data preparation, then we train our model. And this part is finished while when we generate uh, what we call an Astor file, the analytical store, Basically, this is the binary representation of our model and which is basically the object that we use then in the online inferencing environment. Uh, this object contains the model so we can ingest the video, process the data, use the model to do the object detection uh, part. And then we add some other uh, objects here, object tracking and geofencing. And finally, we got the, uh, the counting and the alerts. So just, Something important to remember here, the training environment is different from the uh, scoring or the inferencing environment. In this case, we had to use, uh, we use a specific product from SAS, it's called SAS CSPs, which is basically, is defined as a, a complex event processor. So basically it's able to process many, many events per second. So we can use the model in streaming while, the, while we get the, cam the, the video from the camera. And in this case, we had to score frame by frame the video uh, recorded by the camera. And actually, it, this, this of course, can also be installed directly on the camera, okay? So you don't need to save the video afterwards. You just record uh, live, score the video, and then you got the counting. Again, this is a SAS product, but you could use, I think, also other, other tools, of course. Uh, and Daniele will explain the technique, how this basically, how this part works. I will cover the first part. Uh, okay, so let's get some, actually some, some specifics, some details uh, on the project. So we said the first part is the training points. And if you, if you know how to work on this type of project, you know that the data preparation part in this case is very, very extensive. You need to have some uh, training data and to have the training data, you need to label, uh, in this case, uh, frames or images. You need to have your bounding box around the cars or the vehicles, and you you put you input this data to to the model for the training. So, uh, what we got from the customer was uh, uh, some some videos, so ten videos. Um, we had to label them, and actually, if you want to label frame by frame a video, you know, is is very very long. So we use a specific tool. This is it's called Civat. It's an open source tool that you can use to label videos in a very, very uh, easy way. You have, an, it's called an interpolation mode, which basically allows you to label, say, uh, two frames, and automatically the system um, label uh, all the frames in between. So that's why it's called interpolation. So this is really uh, bringing down the time that you need to do the, the, the labeling part. Then, uh, uh, we also added, apart from the videos that we got from the customer, we also added some images from the open image data sets that we got. Uh, we can use for commercial use in SaaS. Uh, so we, we added other uh, videos, other images, so we could, let's say, have a model that generalizes better. So this is the data prep part. And then we trained the model. We took a tiny YOLO V2 model for uh, real-time scoring. We will see the details of this model, but basically you just need to remember this is, um, we're of course talking about deep learning model, but this is, uh, let's say, 
the, 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 the time that you need to, to do inference with this uh, model is very, very lower. So we can use it for real time scoring. The second part, what Daniela will tell us is basically the video processing part. So we use ESP, as we said. So we take our model and we, we, we detect the objects with the model and we track them, meaning we can follow them frame by frame and we can say they are the same object. Even when the, the car is here, we, are, we know that it is actually the same object that we saw before. We have the virtual fence part. Again, we will, we will see that part as well, in which we actually, we're adding these two virtual lines here and then we're able to generate uh, alerts and, and, and counts, right? Then, okay, we also add uh, another uh, aspect of the project was the visualization part. We don't cover that today, but we use OpenCV to visualize the results. And we also created some live dashboard um, for the user, for the end user to, to see the, the model results. So we said this is not part of today, but I think it's important to, uh, to highlight that uh, yes, you, we are building an analytical system, but this system is useless if the, the final user cannot see the results and take actions uh, according to the data that we have. So visualizing the data, live data, was really, really important for the customer. So in this, this is just a, an example of the dashboard that we built. We can visualize for each of the cameras that we got for any specific time the type of traffic that we have. We had mostly cars coming from the left and for the, from the left part of the camera, buses, truck person. So you can kind of analyze the results and based on this data, you can decide whether you or not you need a bridge, okay? So this is something important usually in, in this type of project, but usually they're not really the what people talk about because the nice, the, the interesting part of course is the object detection part maybe, but this as well is an important piece. Okay, so enough for that. So now what we want to do here is actually uh, understand how we actually build the system. Okay, so this first part is actually uh, related to the model training part. So we're gonna talk about convolutional neural network. Uh, and in the second part, we will see the, the inferencing part with Daniele. So talking about convolutional neural network, what uh, I guess you, you said you almost uh, all of you know the concept of this. Basically, this is a specific class of a deep learning model. And we will spend the next, let's say, five minutes talking about this. So in general, you could use uh, also other uh, deep learning architecture which are actually proven to be very, very good for a complex task. But the problem is the, compu the computational uh, time and power that you need to train this model. And if you don't have a convolutional neural network and you're working with images, you would, it would be almost impossible to train this model. So the reason why we use this specific type of model is that the, the, parame the learning parameters uh, are much, much, uh, the number of these parameters are lower with this type of class uh, of model, okay? So this is why we're using this. Uh, this is just, okay, to recap, we are, of course, talking about the offline model training phase, okay? Um, so we said the convolutional neural network are used to analyze images, right? Uh, so in this area of image analysis, we, we can distinguish between different tasks. If, if we stay simple, of course, uh, then we can have other, other tasks. But if we stay simple, we can distinguish, distinguish between these four uh, tasks here. So classification, you get an image and you classify it is, uh, for example, in this case, cat or dog or something else. So you, for example, if you are a Silicon Valley a fan, this could be hot dog or not hot dog, okay? So just simply a classification for the image. You don't have any other information. Then we have the localization part in which, uh, yes, we get the classification, but also we are able to draw a bounding box around, around the object that we, class, that we detect, in, right? And then if we move forward to the object detection, basically it's the same type of task here, but with multiple objects in the same image, also 
multiple objects with different classes. So in this case, we have a dog, we have cats, and we have a little duck here, okay? So this is object action. This is basically what we did for our, what we uh, did for our system. Uh, then, as I said, we, we also have, for example, other type of task, instance segmentation or semantic segmentation, which we categorize uh, the pixel. So the individual pixel of the image are being classified. Uh, so this is a more advanced task, I would say. Then, of okay, course, we, we can have other uh, task, for example, I don't know, uh, guns and so on, but okay, to, for today we, we, we covered this part. Um, okay, so the next question is actually how can we actually analyze an image? How can we input an image to a model? Now, um, images of course are just a group of pixels, right? And each pixel has a specific color associated with it. So when you translate the color into numbers that you have your input data for your model, right? So in this case, we have a gray scale image. Each pixel can be either uh, white or black, and then, okay, all the colors in between. If it is uh, white, you have, a, uh, the number is 255. And if it is black, you have almost zero, okay? And then you have all the, the colors in between. and at the end, you get something like that. So from an image, okay, this is a very blurry image, but then you got this type of information. Now, we are talking about actually images with colors. And when we have colors, we have three channels, not only one. We have the RGB channel. Uh, probably you have heard about that. But for example, to, to have a purple like this, you have a color, a number associated with the channel of the red, a number associated with the green channel and a number associated with the blue channel. So imagine this image here, you have three channels, so three, three times this information, then you have also an image with colors. Um, so today actually images can have uh, millions of pixels. Uh, imagine like clinical images when you have X-ray scans and so on. So images can be very, very big. And that's why we need a specific class of model to analyze these images. Otherwise, we will have a model with too many parameters, which is impossible to train. That's why now we talk about convolutional neural network. So convolutional neural network are, a as I said, a specific type of deep learning model. Basically, in this, in this type of architecture, we apply some filters like this one to the image to detect some uh, aspect of the image, okay? The, the reason why it's called convolutional is uh, because of the way we apply this filter on the image. We basically, we apply, we slide through the image and we apply the same filter all over the image uh, uh, at once, you know? So th that's why it's called convolutional because of this sliding way of applying this filter. And usually uh, in convolutional neural network, you have this convolution. Then you have pooling layers, which are basically just reducing the size of the, the inputs. And you, if you consider this to be a layer, then you have many of these layer, one after the other. Uh, that's why it's also called, of course, a deep learning because you have uh, multiple layers. Uh, finally, we have a fully connected layers, which basically represents all the information in a multi-dimensional vectors. And based on this vector, we are able to classify, for example, the image, okay? So uh, this was a very, very quick introduction to convolutional neural network. Of course, if you are interested in this concept, I, I, I suggest you to, to check this. Uh, I think I'm, we are a little bit behind, so I will skip a couple of slides here. We are talking about object detection. So as well here, we have a different type of, uh, a number of different models, of course. We have, for example, region, uh, RCNN, so these are region proposal network, uh, faster RCNN, uh, mask RCNN, okay. But what we use is actually YOLO. YOLO uh, is a specific, uh, has a specific architecture, which basically involves a single convolutional neural network to do all the work. So that means it's very, very quick and can also be used in, uh, in real time. So this is what we wanted. So that's why we ended up choosing this type of architecture. 
so basically, again, very, very quickly, what YOLO does is to split the image in grids. Then each grid is basically responsible to detect a number of bounding boxes. Okay. So you, uh, at the first time you end up with something like that, you have a lot of bounding boxes. Uh, and eventually we filter out and we use only the bounding boxes with the highest probability and we get something like that. Okay. And since we're doing this only at once, so YOLO means you only look once, meaning we are using the, a single convolutional neural network here, and this is pretty, pretty quick. Um, okay, so here I just wanted to show you uh, a notebook. So this is the notebook, one of the notebooks we use to train the model, uh, just for the one that are interested. I hope you can see that as well. Yes, okay. Um, so in here, what we did, okay, we imported some libraries. Here we're using, as we said, the, the, the SAS engine, okay? So with these libraries, we can connect to our SAS engine and use a Jupyter Notebook interface to code, basically. So we connect to our system, we load some data. Uh, so these are the images we got from the customer, plus some other images. And then we define our model. Uh, in this case, you see this is a tiny YOLO, so it's a, it's a smaller version of the, the YOLO model. And then if we go down here, here we define all the, the, the tuning parameters and we train the model, okay? So we, this could take some time, uh, depending on the type of our, uh, environment you have. And you see that, for example, here, the accuracy on the train set is almost 90%. And in this case, is 75% of the validation set. So we were pretty satisfied. And eventually what we did was to save the model into the Astor file that we mentioned before. And this is the object that Daniele will now explain how we can use this to then uh, score the, 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 the video with, with, this, with this model. Okay, so I will give the word to you, Daniele, for the, for the next part. Very short introduction on myself. My name is Daniele Cazzari. I'm based in Italy and I work for uh, SAS in uh, the IoT division. IoT is a group we established in, here at SAS in order to take care of all the problems that uh, are linked with devices. So in this scenario also, computer vision is a really device-centric problem because we use data from a camera that is a typical device. Uh, in this, uh, uh, this is a kind of uh, groups that is uh, comprehend a lot of uh, divisions. So there are four divisions that uh, are, are the goal really to think about and uh, de develop products to support these uh, use cases. So I'm a part of the product management group. So I'm taking care of the, uh, to find out the new feature we need the product and also try to understand how it's better to deploy and use it. So which is the new technology that we need to take care of. In, the, um, in this presentation that I'm going to share with you, we started with thinking how to deploy, develop the model is very, interesting part because the ability to see as the human high see is, uh, is something very new and very fascinating for myself. What is, is uh, doing now is the more practical part. So, okay, we have this model, we need to operationalize in the way we get the information we need that we could use in the system. So this is mostly my, my, my work and what I'm doing. So, so let's start with something uh, funny. So I mean, a kind of video to show you what we did and what the results. So I mean, we are out from the project, so from the project of the customer, we cannot show you, but this is an example that my daughter will uh, enjoy it a lot to record for us. So we see this, this is a, my camera and this is a line that divides the screen and we count on the top uh, who, how many person are in and out. And then with this, we see the editors of the fence. So now we, we are uh, changing the fence. So we, we like to get a kind of um, circle shape uh, that is a fence and uh, counting what if you are inside the circle, outside the circle. So this is just to, to show you the powerfulness of, of the tool and what we achieved. So, and this is, you see two things. So you, this uh, number on the top of the face is the tracking and this, uh, this uh, line that uh, we draw is exactly that we, we track our 
movement. And this is also what will help us to count if we are inside or outside this kind of circle. So we know we are and how many person they are inside outside. So this is another example with the tool we made that we have uh, for um, with with a uh, uh, rectangle. That's uh, and uh, yes, we, you could see that this also the, the way it works. So you see on the top, and uh, that's in and out if you are inside or outside the, the, the rectangle. And I think this is this is uh, make uh, make the sense of uh, the activity. Of, of course, this. This is funny with my daughter, but you could. This is exactly the same technique, and exactly the, the, the this this the same tools we use it for the real project for the um, uh, for the railroad crossing. The, the only difference that that one, of course, is was for a customer, so we cannot show it in the, in the video. Um, so coming back to the, you see already this picture. I try to uh, detail a little bit uh, the right parts so of the the. The left part was already very well explained by Matteo, so I will not spend a time on this. You, you, you see before that we get the store. So what, what happened? So when we get the store, we, we start the inferencing part. So it's the operationalization of this algorithm. So first of all, we needed to connect a video ingestion. That could be a camera connected directly or most probably a streaming video uh, that we collect from uh, an, ex an external source. Uh, this is maybe I mean this is an example. So for this this demo, we use uh, um, edge device called uh, Nvidia. That in an, is uh, an Nvidia board, a single system on chip. Uh, the, the, this, for the example, we use, use both JSON TX2 that is a little bit more powerful, and also it's possible to use JSON Nano. It's only one hundred dollars, so it's mostly very very cheap cheap solution and. Is also has GPU capability, so it's able to process and uh, uh, video data, and, um, and also able to process uh, computer vision algorithm fast. Because this kind of algorithm are, require a lot of parallel um, data processing, and the GPU is very helpful for doing this kind of job. So we get this board, we pro we get the data, we process the data. I mean, we we so we get. The, very big size, uh, big big image. We reduce it for the algorithm. We alter um, reshape a little bit because the algorithm like uh, to have squared image. Uh, then we we use this a store file for uh, for detecting the object, and then after this we apply two algorithms. That is part of the this uh, inferences. So as part of this area, this object tracking and geofencing. So uh, the model itself will only recognize the object. Then thanks for. Uh, other algorithm we apply inside of this uh, this tool, we are able also to track and geofence the object. And let's see in detail what that I mean. So, for uh, track for geofencing is this is the concept of virtual fence. So it's a kind of virtual perimeter we could draw. This could be inside a geographical area. So in this case, we have, will have a latitude and longitude as coordinate. Uh, to define the, this area, or in the, in, this, in the case of this example, is inside of a picture. That's that's the area is defined by x and y in, inside of the picture. In in both cases, this is a kind of uh, um, dynamically generated per perimeter. As you see in, in the video, I we change it. We were able to change the the, the fence uh, and the area while the the video and the, the the object detection was going on because this is really something it could be changed dynamically. Another um, this is also the tool we developed in in, in Python uh, using Guidi to 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 make this uh, visible in, in uh, as a GUI uh, and. All this stuff is uh, done to in, inside of uh, our product. Uh, we did it in SAS. Uh, the, the product is, uh, we already, Matteo already mentioned it, is called, we call ESP, so Event Stream Processing, is a um, kind of stream processing engine. So it's capable to uh, process and make, uh, um, apply algorithm, but also data cleaning, uh, aggregation, thresholding in real time in memory. So this is something very important because actually we don't have to store this image to process them. We don't have to um, make any, also this is important for privacy. For example, we fuse video data. So we don't need really to, to store anywhere and we could 
process of the fly. It's also important for reducing latency because doing memory, we don't require us to store and, and uh, read back. That is uh, something very in, uh, intensive process in terms of latency and timing. So this engine so is, is capable to do is do so, and uh, inside of this engine, you could do a lot of operation. In this scenario, we are applying machine learning and do some data preparation to uh, to uh, change the image. We also apply some algorithms so like geofencing and uh, object tracking. You could do more, you could do calculation, pattern detection, threshold. So it's, it's quite versatile. You could do it in very uh, different scenario. Uh, there is a we come to studio. We'll show you later. That says allow you to uh, show a little to develop this in a graphical way. You have also graphical streaming view. Stream viewer is a graphical capability allow you to show the stream how it works, and also to create dashboard for the user. I mean near the edge user mostly. So the one who is, will be nearby the, the the this kind of stream processing engine if if they need to. Uh, to wait and see what is going on. And also we are capable to manage a big, big, big group of uh, ESP deployed in, uh, in a vast area. Now, the only very interesting stuff of this product is, uh, is developed with a very small footprint. It could work with the smallest device, so a Jetson Nanoba or so a Raspberry. It could stay on and they could go scale up to, to cloud environment, bigger environment. It's the same engine. The, the, the only difference is the amount of memory and the, uh, the amount of GPU that will be access. And so they will be able, of course, with higher uh, hardware to, to process much more data and much more concurrency. So, for example, with a Jetson, uh, we were able to process process one camera. If you, we create a bigger server, we could process multiple camera in the same hardware. So, just to detail a little bit, so outside the obj object detection, so this is the other two feature. Uh, this is the, the first one we are we are using in ESP. This is first is the object tracker windows. So you see the object, the, the idea of these windows is uh, accurately estimated the, uh, the identity. So try to track and give a number to an object and uh, be able to track in the camera. So you see in this video that we are able to, to place a number of these people that's uh, uh, going this, around the counter and track their movement inside of the picture till they go, go out of the pitch. This is done with uh, using uh, an algorithm called intersector of a union that is actually try to understand and, and predict uh, from one frame to another frame what is the most probable location in the second frame of the same object that, was, that we, it was, we would detect in the first frame. This is this is in the way that so we to make also the this kind of uh, um, things independent. So we actually the object tracking is working frame by frame. So it's, it's really taking care of uh, each frame uh, and uh, this this make the things together. So it's, it's uh, make the relationship with frame one and frame two in order to understand where where uh, the object are and uh, to count that to track them. Another way well, fast because we're a little bit out of time. Uh, the other we already explained a little bit this. The other capability is geofencing. We explained before. The, the, the important point here is that uh, you uh, have the capability to uh, change the geometry uh, at the fly and uh, you're streaming in this kind of geofencing window the position and also the geometry and 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 the match of the two will, will give you the alert. So this is just very briefly and fast. Uh, let me go uh, and show you the um, the project, how I will look like uh, from a uh, uh, browser perspective. So this is the application where you use to develop uh, uh, this, this, uh, this flow. So we, you see we have a data ingestion. So this is, in this case, is really a camera. So we connect here uh, with a, this is UVC connector. We connect uh, with, the, with the camera, with pro properties, so with the kind of uh, formatting and also where the device is, is located. And uh, with the height of the frames to, to we ingest. Uh, then we do resizing because the, the, the image, requ uh, the YOLO score require a squared image. This was a rectangular image. It also needs smaller in order to ensure better processing. Uh, and this will be the input of the scoring uh, windows. Scoring windows, of course, will 
get get the model from these reader windows that's load the model and push the model to the scoring windows this is the reading windows is the one that is responsible to to load yes store so here i mean is, you see that the, the the file is loaded um and that that's that's uh that is the yolo windows and uh, that's it's load load this file then we go to the object tracker uh that will be responsible for track the object this is quite straightforward windows of course there is some properties we, we could set about uh, uh, the threshold the, the the number of vector we take in consideration and uh, how much max frame will allow to get missing uh, in order to stop tracking and so on. that's something you, you could tune for your project then we have the geofence windows uh that is the one responsible for uh uh, to, to, to control if the, if the object is in and out of the, our fence and get, as we see, the input from another windows, not a source window, that is geometry source window, that is where we push them the geometry that need to be uh, fenced. And this will be provided as a result to um, the visualization part we, we, we see before. So we could send to another system for visualization purpose. As you might see very, very briefly, you have a lot of possibility here in this tool uh, to manage data. So it's not only for a computer vision, you could you could use, you could manage mostly all your URT data, your possibility to aggregate, filter, uh, transpose the data, and also have uh, some feature like a pattern matching that's allow you to find a pattern in the streaming data. Uh, possibility to notify some some behavior to your email and or other system, and uh, also include the external uh, feature. So, stay, saying that, since since we are a little bit out, out of time, I'm I'm jump very fast back to the presentation. Um, sorry, and probably it's better to go directly to the right slide. Okay, so I mean. This is, uh, you, you said two words, uh, Matteo, on this slide? Yeah, yeah, so very, very quickly. So we, we saw, uh, let's say, the the, the 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 project we have been working on, so on the railway projects, uh, where we use this type of uh, system, right? Uh, now we saw the video with Daniele, also Daniele's daughter. Okay, that is like a fine project, but of course we can apply this type of uh, techniques in other other use cases. Uh, and this is actually what we are also working on right now uh, at SAS. So similar use cases, for example, if you are in a in a plant or something that, that you see in the picture like that, so you you want to monitor uh, people working uh, in that uh, let's say production site, but you don't want them to to go in some specific areas, right? Because it's dangerous because maybe they are not allowed in some specific. Uh, hours of the day, for example. So here we can draw uh, a, a virtual fence in there and see if there are actually people that are going in those area or not. Or something uh, different is what we see at the, at the bottom. Uh, if you are in a warehouse or yeah, in a production plant, uh, we don't want people to stay close to the machinery while they are in uh, they are working, right? So because again, it's, it's dangerous. So you can again draw a fence uh, to detect if people are uh, close or not to this machinery. So these are, of course, example of other use case. We are happy to hear if you have other ideas, but this is what we are working on right now. And uh, yeah, thank you, Matteo. And this last slide, if you want to try what we, we show, there is a, uh, we have a free trial that is also already available on the cloud. So you don't have to install nothing. Just go on the website with the link we will provide you and uh, you could, uh, uh, you could try it in a really few seconds, just register. You will have access to environment. You could also test some of these uh, example with the uh, object detection uh, we have in, in inside of, of this uh, trial. Uh, yeah, so the first question is actually for you, Danny. So, uh, Pawen, uh, I hope you, I pronounce your name correctly, is asking, okay, uh, we're talking about object detection and normally on camera, we couldn't get a full image of objects. For example, on a highway, we may have a car behind the truck and showing only half of the frames. How do we detect if there is a car behind that truck? 
Right, this, is a, this is an interesting question. Of course, we could detect only what is visible to human eyes, because actually this is the uh, this is the idea of the um, of the tool. But of course, if we have a, a but what is also good of this tool that we are working frame by frame. So even if it's very briefly vis visible, maybe the, the human eyes is not really able to catch it because it's stay one or two frames. Usually, this camera stream at 25 frames per second or even more sometimes. You are able to, to detect this, so is is uh, is really a matter. So if it's visible also briefly, one frame even, you are able to to to, to catch this car, if, if, even if it's partial, of course. If uh, if it's not visible at all, uh, this is this this will require to to to, to check a, a, a second camera. I mean, we have we have some uh, setup in uh, in highway, and they are they, have, they usually they have multiple camera for each line, yeah. one for each line. But yeah, so the, I think this is an interesting question because this is actually a problem that we got during the, the project. <laughs> yeah, and of course, uh, unfortunately, we only got one camera, so I think we missed. We might have missed some of the cars. Uh, actually, the, the, the accuracy measures we had at the end was pretty, pretty good. But I think, okay, we, we, actually, if, if the car is behind the truck for the entire uh, period of time that we, we, we see them, hmm. uh, we will not be able to detect them if we only have one camera. I think that is, but yeah, yeah it was, yeah. But in most of the, uh, I mean, if you will, will see the full video, most of the, that we cannot show this, in most of the cases when you cross the uh, railroad, the, the, you have the track in one direction and the car in the other direction, you have uh, some second of uh, yeah. free free vision and you could detect the car. Yeah, so then, then let's continue. I have a question from Andrea yeah. um, and he suggests to play the devil's advocate. So it's, uh, it's a probably tricky question. Uh, to know what kind of, I, I will read because I just don't want to miss the, the details because we're talking about the technical stuff here. Yep. Uh, so, um, uh, to know what kind of vehicles pass, how does your model compares to a guy standing there for a week with pen and paper? And that was the question uh, at the beginning of the presentation. Yeah. So, uh, I can take that and, uh, Danny, if you want to add sure, later. Right. Um, I guess that it's impossible to have a system that is more accurate than a person in this case. We, we are assuming that persons are able to detect objects 100% of the time, if they're of course able to stay awake for <laughs> 24 hours, uh, assuming that. Uh, this is actually not the point for us. Uh, first of all, because we have multiple cameras, the customer uh, wanted to analyze not just one camera, but multiple. So you might need multiple person as well to do this. And also, we wanted to analyze the traffic for a, a long period of time. So say, uh, even if it's just a week of video, okay? So you would need a, a person for one week for each camera. And you would also need this person to be awake for an uh, entire uh, week. So the accuracy, actually, that you might get at the end is not uh, super, super good. But in any case, we wanted to have a system that is able to do this in parallel. So you, of course, you can run the model uh, in different cameras uh, in real time as well. So of course, we, we, we show you the option to show it uh, to, to run the model in real time. We can also do batch, okay? So you can run the model on the old videos that you might have and you run it in batch during the night and you get the results. So the point was to have these numbers in a let's say a quick time after of course you have the model without using person to do this manual task i, I will add something because, because yeah. since i'm on the operational side so i'm say i will i will argue to the fact that the uh person human person would be better the algorithm because actually yeah you should is an ideal person that is stay yeah. awake uh, and is able to watch all the car that is moving fast and counting uh, will be better, but I mean, there's no, we are nobody is ideal. Nobody could keep attention on a video for uh, even eight, eight hours of work. Uh, so that's that is the, the beauty of the machine. The machine does not get bored or that get tired. Uh, and and also, I mean, they have a, and they have a predictable error, while while a human does not have this predictable error. So we, from the model, we might know at least at least that maybe 
precise 95% of the time. For a human being, we don't know. There's maybe human being precise 99% of the time, and some one precises 80% of the time. And this depends really how we perform the task and what is the, 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 the condition no, around it. Exactly. This. And I think this is a good point because, of course, we, we told the customer the expected accuracy, and they were fine, even if we, we said, okay, the model is not 100% accurate. Right, because at the end, the, the information they needed was, uh, let's say, to, to give a sense of the traffic. Of course, if you miss 10 cars in a day, it's still fine. <laughs> you will still have the information uh, to decide whether or not you need the bridge. So there are multiple uh, things to take into consideration, I guess. But yeah, yeah. good question. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and we have another good question that, uh, for example, I was also interested in all of uh, asking is asking how robust is uh, your system regarding different lightning situations? Oh, for example, that's, uh, what that's another cloudy rain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, I think this was, uh, again, an important part. Of course, uh, uh, I think everyone agrees it's more difficult to detect objects in the in the dark because you cannot really distinguish between uh, a car and the background. Uh, we got, uh, we, we also have some videos from the customer with the dark light. So we trained the model on, on different conditions. Um, actually, I was a little bit surprised that the accuracy on with the dark light, of course it was lower, but not that lower compared to the, the optimal condition. So I think it's all about having the right uh, data set when you train the model, right? So if you, if you do have all the different condition, uh, you can train it. Uh, of course, uh, during, the line, during the night, the, the accuracy will not be lower, but again, we need to remember that what we needed was a system uh, to count the cars. So in this case, we don't, we don't simply see the, the model accuracy. Then we also need to take into account the overall system accuracy, which is provided that we detected this object, can we count it, right? And this was the da Daniele's part. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I mean, I agree with you. And so, as uh, actually, it's also a matter of the quality of the camera. Of course, this was a good camera. And just to be to be sure, I mean, uh, when when Matteo say we we have a problem, I mean, we never miss a car, or just sometimes we 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 misinterpret. So maybe we say this a car is a it was a small truck or vice versa. But actually, the system mostly never miss miss a car crossing uh, the 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 railroad. That, yeah, that's, exactly. That's so a, even even if the accuracy on the object detection model yeah. was lower. The, the the system that you you built, Danny, was yeah. also able to take that into account, and yeah. Also, because we had a kind of 30, 40 frame to 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 between the, in a standard pass. So, in a, of course, the mode maybe not detect all 40 frame, but one will usually get it. So, the in overall, the system was quite precise in in counting and. Um, just maybe some some very small amount of of uh, mis, mis, uh, misleading detection of the type of the vehicles, but this is the only thing that was missing. Um, we are already out of time, but I would like that we uh, make it with the two questions. So, if it's possible, uh, shorter. And we have another question which uh, should be shorter. Stefan is asking how much work in mandates went into generating the training data set with uh, TVAT. Um. So if I remember correctly, for the 10 videos that we had, so it was 20,000 frames that we extracted. It was uh, something like three weeks uh, with two person doing that. Uh, then, as I said, we also added other images that we got from some open data sets. And we did that, first of all, because we didn't want to spend two months uh, labeling these, these images, but also because we wanted to have other perspective, other views, right? Uh, so not from the same camera or cameras that we got. So we added also other images and let's say putting together all of these data set is if we need, uh, of course, it's something we need to do also that part takes some time. Uh, but yeah, I would say three weeks in total. And CVAT is actually a pretty, pretty interesting tool because uh, with the interpolation mode, you don't really need to go uh, frame by frame. If you have to do that, that this would have taken four months, I guess. Yeah. 
And so, actually, Git yeah. is clever and clever, so that's clever because actually they had also computer vision algorithm inside it. So exactly. <laughs> they, they 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 kind of help us to to train with the computer vision, so that that annotated with computer vision make it easier. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, the, then uh, the project itself. So the, the the my project, my part itself was kind of one week uh, of developing plus a, plus a week of testing. So I mean, like, like this, that's overall testing of everything, the algorithm and, and my part. Yeah. Uh, and the last question, uh, what kind of device did you deploy on the edge? And uh, if uh, Raspberry Pi would be enough, Jonas is asking probably he would like to uh, try it at home with the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, I'll, try, I'll take on this. I mean, uh, the we use Jetson Nano and Jetson TX2. So there is a similar to Raspberry Pi, but it's from uh, NVIDIA. The, the reason why we need this board is for the, the computer vision algorithm. So these two board has a GPU acceleration that uh, uh, um, the Raspberry doesn't have. Um, so we could, I mean, if you could try on Raspberry, but you need to, to lower, I mean, you could get probably one frame, uh, maybe also two fr oh, uh, 0 0.5 frame per second. So you need two seconds to score one frame. This is the problem. They don't have a good GPU solution. And so this will be slower. On this area, but I mean, the the, the nano costed most more or less the same amount of uh, money as the Raspberry, so it's it's very really comparable. 